Amen. Well, if you'll stand with me and open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. We are reading the exact same verses as last week, but this is um, taking the other relationship. Uh, We looked at the vocational complementary nature of man and woman last week, and now the relational aspect in marriage. Be reminded as you turn there that this is God's own word, and every single word of it is inspired by the Holy Spirit without error of any kind, and it is the only final authority in all that we are to believe and do. So be addressed by God Himself as you hear the words of Genesis 2, starting in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for your ordination of these spheres of creation at the beginning and for telling us about them, for giving definition and shape to the way that we are in body and soul, the way that we are as individuals and then coming together, husband and wife, that great building block of society that honors you, but ultimately pointing forward to your gospel, to your son, to the marriage that never ends. Lord, teach us now all the glory that is in this. Correct us where we need to be corrected and challenge us and encourage us where we need that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title is, God Made These Two One Flesh. Second straight week, as I said, we're drawing from the same text Moving from the vocational need of Adam to the relational need. Now, they're inseparable, but they could still be distinguished, and I thought it was worth distinguishing them. There's a lot here. So we're going to look at four points. So I key in on certain parts of the text. First, we'll see marriage by God. It's His doing, His making. Marriage by God. Secondly, marriage from creation. Thirdly, marriage for maturity. And then fourth, marriage without shame. The big idea, and here in this big idea, there's going to be something general about creation, or we could say the old creation, and then something specific that this is driving toward in the gospel. So here it is. Here's the doctrine from today. That God from the beginning and Christ in the gospel is the first and final cause of marriage. God from the beginning and Christ in the gospel is the first and final cause of marriage. Let's first look at the divine activity, God's role, which is the most important to start with. Consider that there's a wedding at the beginning of the Bible and there's a wedding at the end. I stole that line from myself. Every time I've done a wedding, I start with those words when I've got the two right in front of me, and I know I've got unbelievers in there. And it's not, I don't care that they don't know that it's about the gospel and stuff like that. I do, and I want them to know it. 
And it is instructive, and sometimes maybe, we've read the Bible so many times, or maybe just piecemeal or starting randomly at wherever, that maybe we've never noticed that the very beginning of this book and at the very end is a wedding. One in Eden, the other when John is told in Revelation 21, 9, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb, which was the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. The new heavens and new earth, the city Jerusalem is depicted as a bride coming out of the bridal chamber and into, really, down the aisle. Because it is God, the Father, who prepared the bride and who presents her as if walking down the aisle with her to his son in both cases. The first Adam and the last Adam are the recipients. Eve and then the church are the two brides. And so it is here that, verse 22, he made the woman and brought her to the man. Don't miss that. He walked her down the aisle. He presented her. It's a good thing that Eden was a sacred sanctuary, as we saw. It's the perfect wedding venue. But actually, it's just a shadow of the most perfect one to come. One of the two crucial New Testament passages that I want to bring in here, and I want us to think deeply about him, it's always helpful We're always trying to interpret Scripture in light of Scripture, so I think it's very helpful when you have a New Testament passage telling you clearly, hey, remember that thing in the Old Testament? This is what it means. This is what it still means, and now I'm going to draw out even more of what it means. Well, one of those passages is Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, so you'll want to keep one finger there, and the other one's going to be in Matthew 19. But they both explicitly refer back to the Genesis passage, And the first is Paul's statement to the Ephesians about husbands and wives. This is in Ephesians 5. And first, you'll notice the apostle in verse 31 directly quote the Genesis passage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So he tells husbands and wives to do a bunch of things. Tells them this is what marriage is. This is what husbands and wives do toward each other. I want you to do this. And then he says, and this is in a sense, he's saying, because. So I'm going to give you this new creational gospel reason for it, but I'm not leaving behind the old creational purpose. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he adds in verse 32, in case there was any doubt, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Where is Christ in Genesis? We've already seen some hints. But Paul is saying, look here too. This mystery, back in Genesis, I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And we know it's Christ and the church and marriage because if you look at the rest of the passage, the mystery that Paul has in mind throughout that whole passage, he draws an analogy. He doesn't just say husbands and wives do this because of something God is doing. He says, I want you to do this. I want you to act out because of what it says about Christ and the gospel. The analogy is between the husband and wife relationship and the Christ church relationship. In other words, marriage is made by God as a gospel drama. That's what Paul is claiming about back in Genesis 2. God did this from the beginning to tell the gospel. Easy objection to this. You may have thought it before. I have heard it before. Wait a minute. But the unbeliever can't tell the gospel and would have no interest in telling it. Even as a Christian, I may have an interest in it, but I'm no good at it. My sin makes a mockery of a gospel-telling marriage. My answer to that is yes to all of it. It's all true. And yet, it is still true that earthly marriage is designed by God as an image of the eternal marriage. I'm not bothered in the least, and neither should you, that we mess up. We are not God's design. We can mishandle it all we want to, but at the end of the day, the design still holds. We don't get to redraw it by all of our sloppy gospel telling. I rarely do this. I'm going to Quote Doug Wilson, I think there's some things that he gets wrong and I disagree with, but there's something he said about this passage in Ephesians 5 about 
the gospel telling of marriage that's really worth quoting. He says this, in this passage of Ephesians, Paul tells us that husbands, in their role as head, provide a picture of Christ and the church. Because of sin and rebellion, so this is what the objection was, remember? Because of sin and rebellion, many of these pictures, these pictures of Christ and the church, are slanderous lies concerning Christ. But a husband can never stop talking about Christ and the church. If he is obedient to God, he is preaching the truth. If he does not love his wife, he is speaking apostasy and lies, but he is always talking. Here we see that in marriage, just like we saw in dominion and all the social spheres that have been prefigured in Genesis 1 and 2, everything the image of God has been given to act within, the principle always is we do what we do because of what it says about God, not because of any lesser thing, and that includes our mess-ups. And so marriage is by God to talk about God, just like everything else in creation. But here, in a sense, it takes center stage. Secondly, marriage is from creation. Not only is it God's doing, but it's from the beginning. And I know this is obvious here if we look at the big picture. I wouldn't even bother to ask you now, where in the Bible does this institution show up? Because a lot of people don't know. But here we are. We, I think we can answer, well, it's right here in Genesis. And that means that it's not only the beginning of the redemption story, as I just saw from Paul. It's the beginning of the whole story. In other words, marriage is not just a gospel drama, not just a new creational type and shadow that was built in from the beginning, but in addition to that, marriage is a creation ordinance, and therefore it is not subject to renovation by human law or any other social experiment or any other affirmation that you want me to make of some other design. It also means that it's not a sacrament of the church. Contrary to Roman Catholic teaching, it can't be either one of those things because God made it at the beginning over everyone. If God made marriage at the beginning for everyone and through and in every marriage, well, then it can't be changeable by human decree and it can't be a sacrament of the church as if only something that belongs to the Christian. To say that it was a creation ordinance is to say that this is what marriage is for everyone born to the race of Adam, the whole human race. The other crucial New Testament passage, remember I had you turn to another one, and that's Matthew 19. Now, it comes from Jesus himself, and it covers a lot of ground in the whole biblical doctrine of the design of the sexes, as well as the institution of marriage. Jesus is treating both here. Here's what he says in Matthew 19, 4 through 6. He answered, and this is to his disciples, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Now stop right there. What's he talking about right now, made them male and female? Is he yet talking about marriage? In a sense, he is, and you'll see the context. But you can't skip over that he's also talking about their sexuality. He's talking about their natures. He who created them made them male and female and said, so it's the same one who made them who said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. God is not only commanding at the beginning, but He's commanding everyone from that point onward, don't mess with that. That's what Jesus is saying. That the God who designed that is also commanding and telling us this is what it is, it's not something else. So that's my first observation about this text. It goes with our first point that marriage is by God. But Jesus is saying here, He who created them for this purpose... What God has joined together. So not only is it by God, not only is God the one who thought of it, He designed the souls and the bodies of male and female for this purpose and not a contrary purpose. 
not one that runs contrary to this. That's why Jesus is bringing it up. His words in his day were aimed very specifically at perversions in his culture. Divorce was what was center stage in that particular exchange, but also polygamy, which was being practiced even in that culture. But the logic of it clearly applies to any deviation from the design. One male, one female, God has made them for this alone. The center of the description of Eve's making is a perfectly literal divine surgery. It says here in our text, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So just like the trees, just like the garden, just like the days of creation, just like a lot of things we've seen already, is it, is it history or is it symbol? It's like, no, it's both. So we pit those against each other. Real, literal. And this is drawn out not as myth, but don't fly to the other extreme. Neither does it fail to communicate a clear symbolism. And it is one that is broad enough to correct all the errors of every age. That's what overarching designs do. Now, you probably heard this a lot, but don't say this and don't think this to yourself. And that's why I bring in these New Testament texts as well that explain what's going on. Don't fall for this. Oh yeah? Where in the Bible does it specifically say that I cannot, and you start adding to it? You might as well say, where in the Bible does it say that I cannot identify as a cat or marry all 12 of my cousins? Because that's how absurd, first of all, it's where the world is, but that's how absurd you would have always sounded by approaching the Bible in that way. You do realize that we can invent, and we do, all manner of evils, an infinity of distortions of the design, and we could say the same thing. We are inventors of evil, Paul says in Romans 1.30. But here's the key. It's not the burden of proof for the designer to put warning labels on every last molecule in this universe that we could pervert. He sets up a design and says, these are the limits. This is what it's for. And if I, as some nitpicky, lawyery devil start to say, what about this? What about this? Oh, you didn't say that? You didn't say that to 5,000 things. That does not make me sane and rational. It makes me terribly wicked. God's burden of proof is not that simply because we've gone insane. The design is clearly marked in the Old and the New Testament. I know in our culture we reach the point of exhaustion, for example, sayings like, well, you know, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And people roll their eyes and say that's too simple. But here's the thing. He did. Some things just are that simple. So that all nature testifies to it and every child knows it. This is something so simple that you have to talk children out of it to introduce your perversions. It takes the perversion of rebel so-called adults to twist them and turn them aside from their innocence. Even in the church, we hear one such twisting of the simple truth, namely, if you ever heard this, well, Jesus in the New brings in a new order. And the New Testament does not teach that homosexuality or transgenderism were wrong. False. The New Testament is explicit that this runs contrary to nature to God's very creation of things, when the New Testament talks about it, it always says words like unnatural, against creation, from the beginning, contrary to nature. Here's a couple. Paul in Romans 1, 26 and 27. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. You know, in light of what Paul says just a couple verses down in verse 30, that we invent evil. He says, shameless here. I would just say that pretending this is not what it says is shameless. 
Pretending the New Testament is not abundantly clear about this is shameless. Jude 7 says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, where Paul is saying, Do not be deceived. And he lays out this litany of sins that are unfitting and will not be in the kingdom of heaven. Of course, he ends with the gospel and says, and such were some of you, but you've been washed and so forth. And so it it ends up in this gracious celebratory, put that in the past, but in the text it mentions neither the sexually immoral and that it ends with nor effeminate nor homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of God. So marriage is from creation. Male and female are the creational order. Marriage of one man and one woman is the nature of things. If you deviate from that, you incur God's wrath and introduce misery and distortion into your life and all who you love. Thirdly, marriage is for maturity. Said last time that Adam named the animals before God blessed him with Eve, and we saw why, or remember, He had to come to realize something, his need. So there's already been a maturing process of sorts, but now it comes to the surface in something of a song in verse 23. And when it sections that off, it's sectioning off Hebrew poetry. You know, what does that look like? Whether he sang it or we don't know, but he is saying it with great passion. He's not dispassionate. He's not just saying, well, that's interesting. He says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You know, men are suspicious creatures. Uh, We don't like to admit that. We want to protect our own weaknesses. We want to seal up all potential vulnerabilities. We certainly don't want a part of us to be taken out. Uh, Martin Luther called his wife, uh, his wife's name was Catherine, or Katie, he had an affectionate nickname for her. He called her My Rib. My Rib. He got it from the Genesis account. And he did so because he came to realize that just as much as God had called him to get the German church off the ground, God uniquely blessed her to make his house run so well that he had far less vulnerabilities with her than he would have had without her. And so there's this relational symbolism in the rib. I had noticed it this week. I told, I told Emily, I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to do the dishes. and the, I, yeah, I, have, I have to write it down. Yeah, I'm going to do the laundry and do all the stuff. I wrote it down. And I still see it piling up. And I'm only one person. <laughs> so it's true. There's a relational symbolism here. These bones protect the most vital organs. A man's maturity means taking up the mantle of protector, not only from outside forces, but even from his own selfishness. That which protects him by nature now belongs to her as well. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, put it like this, and you could put this on a Hallmark card. This is good. Henry says that the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Who says those Puritans can't write poetry? That's pretty good. And that's true, and that's what's being symbolized here. The naming of Eve also. I've mentioned that before, and how naming is a function of dominion in one sort or another. And so the naming of Eve by Adam has this same act of dominion by definition. And don't forget, domin- I know I said it before, but I want to keep saying it, dominion's not bad. We've made all that God made good. We've twisted into bad things. But simply giving that definition. Here's the general name, woman, verse 23. Later, chapter 3, verse 20, we'll catch the proper name, Eve, because she was mother of all the living. And we'll see why it's fitting for that to come up in that place versus the general name woman here. So we'll come to it. There's grace there. But then finally, marriage without shame. Why is it significant? 
at the last scene in the Garden of Eden, before literally all hell breaks loose upon the earth in the next chapter. Why is it that the last thing we see is the man and the woman at pure rest, holy and happy? We know we have the wrong answer if we answer with suspicion. If our answer is, well, Adam has his guard down. Well, he will, but that's not what's being depicted. They're too complacent. Or as some in the early church, under the spell of Gnosticism, so one of the things about Gnosticism are bodies are bad, and that affected even Augustine, and I usually don't disagree with Augustine, but it affected him as well. Bodily pleasure itself is the problem. That's what's being depicted. Well, none of those are correct. And in fact, all of those would run contrary to the text because it says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, we're going to see in the next chapter a bunch of things flipped from chapter 2, and one of them will be shame. Not ashamed here means what it says, no shame. They had nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing in Eve that had so allured Adam was evil, and nothing in Adam's joy in her was second rate or a distraction from God or any of those things. No, the picture fades away, not with suspenseful, much less ominous music, not that, but as a picture of perfect rest, the day's work done, where the sanctuary that we think of as the church And the sanctuary of a man's castle, his home, all come together. This is what all the work was for. This fellowship, this love, this is what the guard was kept for. To quote Chesterton again, as I did last week, the true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. And that explains a lot, even in this last scene about everything that's come before it, and it's all good. Before we get to that break and we get to Genesis 3, we need to remember that everything here is pure and holy and is never to be blamed for all that sin has brought into the world. Let's apply this to just two things. I think this passage today is for our instruction. If we bring together the vocational need from last week and how man and woman, because man was taken from the ground and woman was taken from his side, and what that said about their tasks together. And then the relational need from this week, we can better appreciate what men and women were uniquely designed to need now relationally from each other. That's different too. They each had a vocational need from each other, and that's controversial enough. Well, they also have a relational need. When Paul tells us in that Ephesians passage, husbands, love your wives. See that word love? And then Paul tells Titus, and through him, to get older women to tell the younger women, sort of a telephone game there, but Paul is really instructing the younger women in the church, Titus 2, 4, to love their husbands, and then he adds your children and so forth. You see those two words, love. The Greek word that is used for love in both of those cases It's a different word. When Paul says this to husbands in Ephesians, he says, husbands, and I'll just use the short version, agape, from the word agapao, I love. Agape, your wife. And then he tells wives, wives, phileo, I'll use the shorter version, it's philandrus, it's an adjective there. But phileo, we get shorter word, philos is the adjective it comes from. We get the word, we get the, the city, Philadelphia. What's that? The city of brotherly love. This could be overdone. A lot of people get it from C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves. And there's four words that are used. The fourth is not translated as love, but it's natural affection, storge. But the uh, three other words, um, phileo, agape, eros, and storge, and, and some people overplay that and say, well, it only means this all the time, you know, and agape means divine love, and we make so many errors, I think, when we do that. However, having said that, 
in this case, there is specificity, and we know that from the contexts and everything we've been seeing about men and women. So let me explain. This has everything to do with Genesis 2, just like these other things in the New Testament did. Agape is that love of deepest devotion that implies an attention and an affection that is paid. It is what women most need to receive, and it is what men most struggle to give. Now, that part is the fall. Hence the command. Why is Paul telling men in Ephesians 5, Husbands, agape your wife. It's what she most needs. It's what you are bad at in the fall. And women don't need phileo love from their husbands so much as agape love. Now let's flip it around to Titus 2. Phileo love is brotherly or friendship love. I've called it, at another point, I called it resume love, and if that helps, the task. He was taken from the ground. This is the love of camaraderie of soldiers or explorers charting out a new territory. Not just the aid given by the cut man in somebody's corner in boxing, but the very legs under his feet to keep him going. It's what men most need to receive, and it's what women most struggle to give in the fall. Hence the command. Men don't need agape love from their wives so much as phileo love. There was a popular book. I'm not a fan of popular books. You probably figured that out about me, but I'm not a fan of popular Christian books, uh, contemporary, because they typically just ape the culture and they try to take a practical 10 steps to, you know, and they borrow secular principles and not a fan. But sometimes they get it right. And there was a book that came out about 20 years ago called Love and Respect. And to be very honest with you, I didn't read the whole thing toward the end and a whole teaching series that came out of it. But their treatment of Ephesians 5 was spot on. And the very idea of love versus respect and why Paul was commanding that to the man and to the woman. It's what he needs and you're not good at. This is what she needs and what you're not good at. And he's drawing from Paul's words. And what I'm suggesting on top of that is that Paul's words make so much more sense rooted in Genesis 2. Love is the need for the woman taken from the side. Respect is the need for the man taken from the ground. It's what respect means, by the way. It's not some cheap, oh, you dissed me and my territory and so on. That can be what it is in sin, but it just means a ground to stand on. Now, don't misunderstand this. I'm not saying that men don't need anything like affection or that women don't need anything like respect. Just like I wasn't saying last week that... um, Men don't support and nurture, or that women don't in any way have a task. Just read Proverbs 31 to see the diversity of how this plays out. But as a general norm, this is the way God wired men and women. In the main, men do not need or want to be loved like women need to be loved, and vice versa. Why? Because God designed each to love and to be loved in harmony with their gender-specific task. And we process all of reality in those lanes. And we all know this deep down inside. I'm just giving you the theological explanation for why it is. Finally, this passage and really everything we've looked at in Genesis 1 and 2. As I come to this point in the end of Genesis 2, I want to say this because I didn't say it strongly enough last week. I was thinking through it. I've dropped hints, but I want to say it clearly. To look back into the Garden of Eden is like getting a closer look into the heart of God's law. We might not think of it like that, but the whole reason for God's commandments. And yet, looking back, forgetting that apart from Christ, that law is a fire. And so the design of Genesis is like its blazing center. And so what might start for us as wonder or curiosity or even inspiration quickly begins to overwhelm us because of all the ways in which we, I, am not as I was made to be. Or, we make another mistake, we simply misapply that which is general 
in Genesis 1 and 2. And in Genesis 1 and 2, you cannot help but stare into the, the DNA of God's design from the surface. And so you easily forget that we are given general principles here. And what do we do? In forgetting that, we hammer ourselves, and we think the preacher is doing that, for some perceived failure as if those generals were a one-to-one program of specifics. Think about it for just a second. As you've listened in the past couple weeks, the single person, the barren womb, the injured or the unemployed man, the empty nester looking back, going through church history, the slave, the mentally incapacitated, or simply the broken in soul and body who's thrown away all of this and then by God's grace come to repent and trying to return, but every day is a struggle to see how. So if any of that is is you, and I'll raise my hand, it's me as I'm the one up here saying it. I just want to say as simply as I can, don't. Don't look back into Eden apart from Christ. But do look back into Eden with Christ and in Christ. The question to start with, if you're ever asking yourself, yee, I, I'm, I failed there, or this doesn't even apply to me, or am I a rebel for not even being on this program or whatever else I want to be, the right question to start with is this. Do you love the design? Because if you love the God whose design it is, then you must love the design. And that design was always aimed, in this case, at what it says specifically about Christ's love for His bride. What we have to love the most about marriage at the end of the day is the gospel, because that's not just fluff. The Bible is specifically saying that it is a gospel drama. But very much unlike what Adam did, very much unlike what we have done, Paul says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot, without wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Who's he talking about there? You. If you're a believer, he has loved you and died for you and washed you clean to present you to himself without blemish. And so that's what you are. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the cleansing work of your son who laid down his life for his bride. We thank you for what you have done with the church in securing our redemption and what you are doing in washing us week after week by the word, by the power of the spirit. Help us to love your design even as we see countless ways every day even as an evidence of our conversion that the Holy Spirit brings conviction, conviction that the unbeliever does not have. Help us to love the design. Help us not to blame the design. Where we have fallen short, where we have been unfaithful, as your word says, you remain faithful for you cannot deny yourself. Help us to plant our flag there on that gospel. Help us to see moving the ground whether it be in nourishing the souls of others, building things for your glory, in marriage, at work, in church, and everywhere else, that you give us the best ground, the ultimate ground that Satan cannot pull out from under us, the righteousness of your own Son. We thank you for that now, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.